What is up, Bitcoiners? We are back. Sorry about the break last week, but uh, we had a couple of uh, of sick folks on the team, so we needed we needed a little break. But we're back. Ansel, how you feeling, my man? I think I'm recovered from the coof. So uh, yeah, ready to get, get at it this week. I wanted to make an update for so two weeks ago, our latest episode. Uh, I put out a question on Twitter and the best answer was going to get a Bitcoin dictionary. And so I'm just going to announce the winner here is witty username 30, Mitch. He's also a contributor at Bitcoin Magazine. I, I didn't know he was a contributor at Bitcoin Magazine, but I did uh, meet him when I was in Kansas City. So great dude, uh, great answer. And uh, maybe we'll do one of those again in the future. Wait, do you want to do you want to review the question in the prompt and uh, what was Mitch's answer? Sure. So I just, uh, last episode, I asked if U.S. inflation is higher than the ECB and the BOJ inflation, how come their central bank's balance sheets are way higher as, you know, per GDP than the U.S.? Because, you know, you'd think the relationship would be swapped. The highest inflation would be from the central bank that has the highest balance sheet. Um, and this was his response. He said, these countries aren't actually printing more money. They are printing more bank reserves and sucking more collateral out of the system. Sucking collateral out means bank loans, uh, banks loan less. And because money is actually printed via loans, printing bank reserves is deflationary. So I thought that was a great answer. Sounds like he's been listening to the podcast. Yeah. Um, so yeah, hey, Mitch. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what you need to do to claim your Bitcoin uh, dictionary, but you got to get it. And to everyone listening who doesn't have their hands on this beautiful magazine, the El Salvador Bitcoin magazine, I finally got my hands on it. And man, it is a beauty. It is absolutely perfect and it is thick. So uh, I think y'all are going to really enjoy it. Don't be that sucker who did not get a Bitcoin magazine before they sold out because this one is absolutely legendary. All right, Ansel, we have a we have a pretty yeah. uh, long list of things we need to talk about. But before we get into it, let's tease uh, next week's guest, who is uh, a big shot in the macro world. Yeah, Tom Luongo, he is his blog is Gold, Goats and Guns. He's been contributing to Zero Hedge for years um, and some of his recent stuff about the ECB and the Fed and geopolitics has just been lights out awesome. So I thought we could talk to him about uh, his insights in geopolitics and macro and Bitcoin. He's a big Bitcoin fan. So I think it's going to be a, a great show next week. So stay tuned. All right. Well, big news this week and, uh, and last week. So we're consolidating a couple of, uh, of weeks of happenings uh, on the central bank layer of society. What's happening with the Fed? Big news overnight this uh, just last night is that Biden has re uh, appointed or or put up Powell for reappointment and um, skipped Lael Brainerd. We've talked about this a lot on the show that Lael Brainerd is more of a dove, more of an MMT type person. She's also more of a globalist friendly uh, central banker. And so a lot of people were. Um, thinking Lael was going to get the nod from Biden, but no, Powell is going to be reappointed as chairman of the Federal Reserve. Um, he, I have a link here. Let me bring this up real quick. Sorry about this. Uh, we'll do this one. While you're yeah. finding that, um, I mean, yeah. you, we have, and you have been kind of projecting the, you know, the, the likelihood of, of Powell keeping his spot, but we've also been highlighting, you know, Brainerd's kind of like, uh, escalation and uh, and and uh, rise within the uh, the Fed kind of hierarchy. Absolutely, um, she's been in, involved uh, high level with banking and the Treasury and other things for several presidents. I think she was uh, initially appointed by Obama, but I could be I could be wrong about that. But yeah, she's been around for a while, and like I said, she is kind of the the globalist pick. Um, where Powell is seen more as perhaps a uh, more friendly to American banks versus some sort of global financial system. So I think that's 
very interesting. Now on this article, just wanted to run through some of this. Um, Powell is a Republican uh, and he faces what will likely be a smooth confirmation in the Senate where he was backed for his first term as chair in an 84-13 vote and whose members he subsequently worked hard to woo. Brainerd would replace Richard Clarita in the vice chair slot and may face opposition from Senate Republicans for her confirmation. She was interviewed by Biden for the chair position and was seen as a strong contender for the separate job of vice chair of supervision, which remains vacant. And we talked about that position uh, on a previous episode. I think it's interesting too, now she's being set up as vice chair. So perhaps you know, this how that usually happens is the vice chair steps into the chairmanship uh, on the next cycle. So uh, we might be looking at Lael Brainerd as uh, chairwoman after Powell leaves. But this is a very pivotal period, I believe, for the, the Fed. And we'll get into a little bit why that is uh, during today. Do you have any comments on that? Well, I just want to highlight again that this exact scenario was forecasted on this show maybe three or four weeks ago because there had been several uh, chair or uh, Fed uh, Fed leaders leaving the Fed um, on their yeah. own, including this vice president role. Um, and you said this makes sense. They're going to keep Powell, and this is where they're going to you know, effectively relieve the Brainerd steam from her ascent um, without, without sacrificing Powell's role as the, as the chair. So uh, you forecasted this on the show and here it is being confirmed several weeks later. Absolutely. I think there is a big shift going on in central banking and Tom is going to, you know, he's an expert in this. Um, his recent stuff. Next has week's been, guest. Yeah. Next week's guest. He is he's going to be a treat to, to listen to. So um, I can't wait to interview him about this, but I, I see a breakup between this kind of global globalization, global friendly central banks and maybe a fed versus the ECB. And now the next story I want to roll into is the ECB. They are really pushing the CBDC. So this week they came out with, uh, they carved out a new portion of their framework, their regulatory framework uh, to address stable coins, Bitcoin, crypto, crypto assets, all of those things fit into here. And I was going to read some of that for you guys. Let's go into here. Uh, this is from the ECB's website, official website, the Euro system will use the new framework to oversee companies enabling or supporting the use of payment cards, credit transfers, direct debits, e-money transfers, and digital payment tokens, including electronic wallets. The PISA framework will also cover crypto asset related services, such as the acceptance of crypto assets by merchants within a card payment scheme and the option to send, receive, or pay with crypto assets via an electronic wallet. Quote, the retail payments ecosystem is evolving fast owing to innovation and technological change. This calls for a forward-looking approach in overseeing digital payment solutions, said ECB Executive Board member Fabio Panetta. The PISA framework will include digital payment tokens such as stablecoins alongside traditional payment instruments and schemes we have gained experience in over the years. International coordinated action will also have to be stepped up to cope with the challenges posed by global payment, digital payment solutions, and stable coins. So um, I highlighted this in, internationally coordinated action because now that Powell has been reappointed and not Lael Brainerd, um, this international coordination is much less likely to happen. And while the ECB is pushing really hard to get regulation on stable coins and to get a CBDC launched, um, the, the US and the Fed are stiff arming this whole thing. And there was a quote um, that I wanted to read here just real quick, also from this Panetta at the ECB. He said that if we don't satisfy this demand, then others will do it. So I really do think that the ECB is scared of losing market share to a tether type stablecoin or even 
possibly a DM from Facebook if that ever gets realized. But uh, the ECB is really worried about their monetary sovereignty. So do you have any comments on that before other comments on uh, the ECB that I have? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's overwhelmingly a bullish dollar scenario. The reality is, is that if the ECB does not take action, the euro is going to get outcompeted by the dollar, um, which is already kind of happening. I think you were one of the yep. first people to start pointing out the fact that tether euro, tether yen, tether, you know, other stable coin um, fiats, they just have no market share at all. Um, you know, they have <laughs> no market cap and no market share and no usage. So people, you know, pretty much if your geography doesn't matter, your unit of account is probably you're going to default to the dollar. Um, so I, it's, a, it's a tough predicament and it's why I'm bearish on CBDCs in general, because I just think that, you know, people are going to prefer either Bitcoin as Bitcoin becomes more and more relevant and, and more trusted, or they're going to default to the dollar, which is the what has Lindy, you know, what has been around the longest, what has the longest brand, the most trust, et cetera. So uh, where, where's the room for, for the next Euro token issued by uh, Europe rather than Tether? I don't know. I, I just don't know where that, that fits. Maybe, maybe, you know, their existing network is going to, uh, is going to enable that, that coin to get a lot of traction, but uh, I, I'm assuming it's going to be worse than Tether and Bitcoin at actually being money because it's going to be connected to the ECB. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty bearish on the on the whole proposition. But the fact that they are in this position and they're going to fight back is forecastable, I think, you know, and again, something we've been talking about for a long time. Yeah, I think the divide is becoming pretty clear. So the ECB and the EU, they are upping their regulation, um, really going hard for the CBDC. They're also um, hoping that there is international cooperation in this, which they're not gonna get. Um, some of the bad things also happening over there in Europe is it looks like they're going back to lockdowns or at least restrictions and they're having massive civil unrest all, all over the continent. While the US, you know, the numbers might be spiking a little bit in the US, but the lockdowns are not on the horizon. And the mandate uh, for stuff uh, having to do with COVID has been stopped in the courts. So there, there is a stark divide that you can also see at the central bank level, which I think is very interesting. Um, the, the Europe is facing maybe a perfect storm. So they have supply chain issues. Um, the Fed is distancing themselves from the ECB. Uh, export numbers are down. So the dollar amount of exports are up. But if you look at the volumes of exports uh, and imports in, in and out of Europe, it's going down. Uh, the numbers, uh, COVID numbers are spiking. Looks like they're going back in lockdown. They have civil unrest. Energy prices are spiking to all-time highs. And winter's coming. I mean, that's a big, big thing. And finally is... Ukraine, the situation in on the, the Russian border, I think is getting very tense. A lot of people are worried about Taiwan and some sort of war starting over there with China and the US and Japan and stuff. But I think the Ukraine situation is much more likely to spiral out of control. So um, yeah, as investors are looking at that, they're looking at the Europe and they're looking at all of these headwinds that they're facing. Oh, plus add to that, what happened after the great financial crisis came the European debt crisis, right? It followed right on the heels of the initial financial crisis. And I think now we had the 2019, 2020 global financial crisis. Number two, we're going to go right into another European debt crisis. So there, there's just so many things compounding. I see capital going to, they're going to, it's going to flee from uh, Europe and into the dollar specifically. So um, any comments on that? Uh, or how, do, how does that tie into Bitcoin, do you think? Honestly, a lot of it is kind of above my pay grade. So I'm glad that you gave a lot of the comments. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think you can, if you're like on Twitter and you're looking at the videos that are being posted, like there's a lot of unrest, Italy, France, uh, Austria, um, where they just implemented some insane lockdown precautions where they're saying if you're unvaccinated, you're locked down, but if you're vaccinated, you're free. So now they have police circling and stopping people checking if they're vaccinated to be outside so i mean an insane invasion of privacy and an autonomy an insane escalation of police officers being able to stop you uh so i mean really kind of i'm, I'm very happy i'm not in austria but um regardless like just insanity so europe is a crazy place right now like you said a perfect storm so uh, it, you do see again, the U S institutions, there are, you know, maybe, maybe our universal healthcare is not there, but our rule of law is much more present and decentralization and choice and freedom is much more present within the U S system. Uh, and I, I think that that's apparent, like I'm in California, one of the strictest places and, you know, I'm still a free person. So uh, I'm definitely not taking that for granted, uh, but I, I think it's a testament to how things are set up in the U.S. versus in Austria and Europe. Absolutely. I think investors see that, right? Investors see that the U.S. is more dedicated to rule of law, that there's less um, maybe hurdles going into the next year and into the future for the U.S. economy versus the European economy, which just looks like it's headed for a really cold winter over there. Now, all of these people are looking at this and they're going to be flooding into the dollar. And I think that Bitcoin could get a spillover effect from this as well, because investors know that a strong dollar is not good. It, it makes everyone's debt burden that much higher, right? If, if, the, if the dollar is going up relative to everything else, it's making everyone's debt burden worse. And so they, they don't want necessarily the dollar to spike, but they want to get capital out of Europe. So Bitcoin is right there. Bitcoin is an available outlet. And I think it's the Bitcoin is going to benefit from this perfect storm just as much as the dollar does. And once again, we will see that this is a competition between the dollar and Bitcoin. That is the competition of the next decade. I 100% I agree. And I think you're bringing up a very interesting point, which is the dollar going up benefits no one because debts are denominated in dollars, but people need to escape to safety. Here's Bitcoin, a non-dollar denominated asset. Um, and the way that people love to use Bitcoin is take out debt in dollars and then buy Bitcoin. So like, you know, Bitcoin as this kind of vehicle in order to speculatively attack the dollar is really picking up steam and you know we haven't even begun to see the snowball start to start to you know avalanche down the hill so uh these are just early days and i think this is a very interesting observation by you and i would be interested to see uh you know how things pan out in the next few months years um and see if your prediction is true well yeah and i think it's a better opportunity to do a speculative attack on the euro. If the euro is dropping relative to the dollar, why don't you borrow in euros? I mean, this is, to me, it's, this could be the first time that we see a major currency get attacked by Bitcoin in this way. Uh, I think the dollar is still too prevalent, you know, in, in every aspect of the financial system to do this, but the euro is half as big as the dollar or a third as big as the dollar. So this could be the big speculative attack that people have been waiting for. And it could be Bitcoin attacking the Euro, which I mean, wow, that, that would be crazy. What's your timeline on uh, a Bitcoin Euro speculative attack in terms of just the incentives push in that direction? I think the dollar shortage is going to get intense here over the next couple months, but uh, throughout 2022, we're going to see a lot of these headlines, I'm sure. Um, and Bitcoin is going to have a great year next year. I, I, I don't know how that works into the four-year cycle, but I see 2022 really being a showdown between 
the dollar and the euro, or sorry, uh, Bitcoin and the euro. Okay, I mean, that's big. And, you know, again, we've been talking about Europe being much weaker than the US and the dollar um, for a long time here. We've also been talking about China really being in a weak position, although they are projecting a lot of strength right now. Uh, China has, is not on our agenda, but you know, is it worth talking about China at all? Yeah, I mean, um, China didn't really have any new news this week. They're still facing this um, real estate bubble popping or imploding. Um, it seems like every few days we get another um, a debt payment missed by a major real estate developer over there in China. But as of right now, it seems to be they're holding things together. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's that Europe has had all this big news this week. And so China didn't really grab a lot of the headlines. But uh, from my vantage point, at least what I have seen this week is there uh, more stability out of China versus the ECB. <laughs> Yo, what is going on, plebs? We're going to take a break from our programming to tell you about the resurrection of our print magazine, starting with the El Salvador issue. Starting this fall, Bitcoin Magazine will be available on newsstands nationwide and at retail stores such as Barnes & Noble. Don't want to get off your couch, though? No problem. You can also go to store.bitcoinmagazine.com. So skip the line and get each issue shipped directly to your front door with our annual subscription. I'm talking four issues a year that contain exclusive interviews and profiles with leading Bitcoiners, actionable insights on the state of the market, breaking news and cultural trends, along with powerful photos and artwork from the best artists in the world. Subscribe today and get 21% off using code podcast at checkout. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T, podcast at checkout. Interesting. All right, guys. Well, you heard, you heard it here first. Europe looks like the weakest out of the superpowers. Um, dollar has a lot to benefit. Bitcoin could benefit. Impending speculative attack. Uh, on Europe and euros getting into Bitcoin. So uh, like those are huge headlines and I mean, some some huge uh, forecasts for what's going to happen in, in macro. Again, uh, if you look back at the US, um, you know, I guess a more conservative approach to uh, <laughs> central banking with Jerome Powell being reappointed by Biden. Uh, and then again, Ansel completely forecasted uh, Brainerd uh, going for that VP spot and that spot being made vacant uh, to relieve her ascent and to give Powell some more time. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, best best macro coverage in Bitcoin here, here uh, on FedWatch. Ansel, to close it out, I mean, we got to talk about price a little bit uh, today, I believe is the 23rd. So this will be published tomorrow on the 24th. Uh, right now, the price is 57000 um, and a lot of volatility. Um, you know, we got as high as 69000 and, uh, you know, dipped all the way down to 53000 I, for one time, for the first time in my life, had absolutely no fiat to buy the dip with. So that was a slightly heart-wrenching uh, moment, but it is what it is. You know, I've been stacking hard for a long time, guys. So, uh, but yes. Ansel, what are your thoughts on, on price action? This price action yeah. has people flustered. It has people flustered. They're like, why? It's supposed to be moon right now. Yeah, um, it's very, very interesting because uh, I wrote about this on my last week's newsletter and I was predicting price to come down. There's a few convergence, you know, places of convergence on the chart around 50, between 52 and 53,000. I still think we can probably go that low but then bounce from there. Um, there is zero FOMO, zero retail craziness this, this cycle. Um, so that hasn't happened yet. I mean, that will happen at the top, you know, at all blow off tops, you are going to get massive retail FOMO. And if we're not there yet, that means that the cycle is nowhere near complete. So I think the next 
Uh, throughout the end of the year, we'll probably see new highs again, and it will be built on fundamentals. You know, these are long-term holders buying in perhaps some sort of um, uh, infrastructure plays or um, uh, future financial product plays that uh, banks are buying in, big institutions are buying in. We'll probably see a lot of announcements like, um, you know, more pension funds dipping their toe in. And so these are, in my opinion, these are fundamental movers. So I think this rally will be built on fundamentals first throughout the rest of the year um, into the start of next year. And then eventually we'll, we will see a retail FOMO, but we do, definitely do not see that right now. Yeah, I mean, we spoke to Dylan LeClaire like two episodes ago and, you know, we went over what was happening on chain. And from that analysis, you could tell it's long-term holders accumulating still. And it was really accumulation at the top. So, um, you know, it wasn't, uh, it really wasn't um, a lot of new buyers coming in and a lot of speculators. There was no, there's no indication that those market participants were playing in Bitcoin. So, um, you know, I think that's bullish, I mean, you know, I think that, yeah, I think that this is just the, as Dylan likes to say, the, uh, the coil is, is getting wound up. So that's what, that's what hold letters accumulating means. Yeah. And I've been comparing this to September of last year. So if you look at September of last year, you know, we went side, we had a little dip and then we went sideways for about a month and then we really broke out higher. So, uh, yeah, this sideways could go on for another couple of weeks uh, before we see any movement higher and it will frustrate the hell out of people. Um, but yeah, we're one day away from a new all time high. It, it could go $10,000 in a day if there's the right, uh, you know, market conditions. So I'm not too worried at all about the price. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely not worried. And uh, my only comment on the Bitcoin cycles is one, this time, you know, famous last words, this time is different, but Bitcoin is much more a legitimate asset now than it ever was before in its past. Um, and I think that those type of investors behave differently. Um, and those type of investors are underweight Bitcoin and overweight other things. So if there is a market scare, maybe they sell other things, maybe. So I think that that is something you can't ignore. And then on the flip side is Bitcoin takes the way of most pain. So if you expected it to be mooning in November, guess what? It's not going to moon in November. That was October. November is, you know, flat Vember. You know, I don't know. So, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully moon for Christmas. But with that being said, you know, whatever everyone is expecting, odds are that's not going to happen. If there's too much of a consensus, you know, Bitcoin is going to wreck, is going to go the way where it wrecks the most people. And that's the way it's going to go is against that kind of like mutual consensus amongst Bitcoiners. So um, I think people should just expect the unexpected and, you know, have have uh, an understanding and faith in the fundamentals. And that's what that's what Bitcoin magazine and FedWatch are for. Awesome, man. Yeah, that's all I had for this week. So um, you want to wrap it up? Yeah. So uh, again, don't miss us next week. We have an awesome interview. Uh, we are going live with Tom, uh, is it Luongo? So from Gold, Goats and Guns. So uh, a macro expert, regularly published on Zero Hedge, has a fantastic um, you know, macro blog, podcast, a, a huge audience. So a uh, really great get. And uh, yeah, like we said, FedWatch is the best spot for all things macro and Bitcoin. You can follow me on Twitter at CK underscore snarks. You can follow Ansel at Ansel Lindner. Get your Bitcoin dictionary. Go read Ansel's work on Bitcoin and markets. Go read his work on Bitcoin magazine. And uh, yeah, give us those five stars. Share. You know the drill. Peace.